watching us. Long way from cleaning floors. Pine Gap is a massive military base that's hid away in the Australian outback, completely away from the public's view. It's jointly run and occupied by the American and Australian governments. The airspace over top of it is a complete no-fly zone, and the complex itself is obviously very locked off. Many of the locals have come to speak of this place as Area 51 of Australia. Now, unlike Area 51, this place hasn't been linked to aliens. It's actually been linked to a super secret, super high-tech surveillance system. At this point, it kind of feels like common knowledge that the government is occasionally peeking in on our conversations. Well, Pine Gap in Australia may be the spot that most of that happens at. Echelon was the codename given to a massive signals intelligence collection device. It's believed that this location in Australia collects this information and stores it there. Think about that. A massive site out in the middle of the outback with all of our info stored on a mass of hard drives at somebody's fingertips. With over 800 people apparently employed at this base, there are 800 several individuals that know more about you than I think any of us would like. Your entire communications history is just waiting there to be revealed to the public. It's no wonder that this place isn't talked about too much because think about how damaging it could be if that info was leaked to the public or somebody got a hold of it. The amount of secrets that could be discovered by spending an hour or two at that place is honestly difficult to comprehend. Number four on this list is Mchitka Island. Mchitka Island is a volcanic island that's part of the Aleutian Islands. And for those of you who aren't aware, the Aleutian Islands are a grouping of islands off of the coast of Alaska that stretch into the Pacific Ocean. Now this place is really interesting because by all accounts, hardly anybody lives there at all. In fact, it's possible that there are no permanent residents there whatsoever. Or that's just what the government wants us to think. Tons of areas on this island just simply can't be found on Google Earth. This would probably go completely unnoticed if it wasn't for the fact that the Americans used this place as a spot for nuclear testing several decades ago. From the 50s to the 70s, this was a spot used by the American government to test out their weapons. Obviously, you don't really want the world knowing about this or seeing your capabilities, so keeping it a secret would be important. This apparently ceased in the 70s, but then it begs the question, why is it blotted out on Google Earth? Why are there sections of this island that the world can't see. Starts to make you think that maybe this isn't just an innocent Aleutian Island in the Pacific Ocean, but actually a spot that never stopped testing weapons. Or if they did stop testing them, then maybe this is where they're developing them now. If I'm about to do something shady, then an island in the middle of nowhere with no permanent residence would certainly be my spot of choice. It's very possible that the American government feels the same way. Number three on this list is Harvey Point Defense Testing Activity Facility. This site is located in North Carolina and is definitely something that the government doesn't like to advertise. Ever wonder where the elites of the elite train, like the super secret, super advanced soldiers that only come out for the crazy covert missions? Well, this is that place. Wikipedia writes, Specialty military air operations are located at this facility as the installation has two usable landing fields and plans for a third. The FAA Charlotte Sectional Aeronautical Chart identifies this area as Special Use Airspace R5301, which is continuously restricted from general aviation traffic from the surface of an altitude of 14,000 feet above mean sea level. Areas of Albermay Sound adjacent to the facility are also under restricted airspace, R5302, which is under the operational authority of Giant Killer, or whichever ATC has controlling authority over the airspace at that time. Harvey Point is also used for CIA paramilitary and counterterrorism courses that involve high explosives and ballistics. The explosives are used to simulate terrorist bombs and can be heard for miles in the surrounding communities. 
It was also used by Devgru to train for the raid that killed Osama bin Laden in a scale mock-up of his secret compound. Pretty much all of the super elite military governmental stuff is going down at this spot. The team that took out Osama bin Laden trained here, like it really doesn't get more secret and advanced than that. Also there have been a ton of rumors about the types of weapons that are being developed here too. Incredibly advanced aircraft that will have capabilities hard for us to even understand are apparently being built here. The advancements may not just stop with equipment either, but may even go further to people as well. Obviously, Iron Man and Captain America are superheroes and they aren't real, but if there ever was a site where the government was to be experimenting with things like that, then this would be it. Either incredibly advanced war body suits or literally making superhumans, then this could be the place where all that goes down. Number two on this list is Jeanette Island. Jeanette Island is located in the East Siberian Sea and belongs to the Russians. This island is shrouded in mystery though for the history it has had with Google Earth. Similarly to our other creepy Alaskan island, when you go on to Google Earth, you can't actually see anything here. In fact, for a while, all you could see was a black blob where an island should be, and then more recently it was changed so that there's literally no landmass here at all. The Sun writes, It's not clear why the island is blurred, although there have been issues around whether the territory belongs to Russia or the USA. Some conspiracy theorists have suggested the spot is an ideal location for a secret Russian military base as it's relatively close to the US and Canada. Google often blocks out military locations on its maps tool, including air bases in Germany, missile silos in Russia, and bases in Afghanistan. Images of the island were provided to Google by the International Bathymetric Chart of the Arctic Ocean, a project to map the Arctic Ocean initiated in St. Petersburg, Russia. This Russian military base thing has definitely been gaining some traction. As the Sun said, this base would be pretty close to North America, which is something Russia would definitely want. It's also super secluded and the perfect spot to be conducting some really questionable experiments or projects that you don't want prying eyes of the world to see. When Google was inevitably asked about why they don't have a picture for this, the spokesperson for them declined to comment. And number one on this list is Zenomensk. This is a Russian city and one that's largely been kept off the radar since its birth because it's something that the Russian government doesn't want anyone to know about. Passport Symphony says, Zenomensk was founded in 1948 as a missile test range facility under the name of Kasputin Yar. Multiple launches of test rockets and satellites were carried out at this site throughout the years. Eventually, Kasputin Yar became a Cosmodrone in 1966 and like the other cities on this list, it wasn't shown on the map until the 1990s. There are many things that make Zanamens the most mysterious city in Russia and one of them is a UFO crashing that happened in the 1950s. Some even argue that this incident allowed the Russians to design Sputnik and achieve an early lead in the space race. This story was kept secret and only recently became known to the media. This made Kasmitsyn Yar known as the Russian Roswell. However, note that this isn't the only mystery that happened at Zenomensk, but rather the only one that made it public. The site's function was interrupted after the fall of the Soviet Union, but it began working again in 1998. We got missile launches, we got weapon development, UFO landings. It's no wonder that the Russians don't want anybody catching on to this place. The fact that it was literally around for almost 50 years before it even appeared on a map is super questionable as well. What the heck was going on at this place for 50 years that was so secretive that they couldn't have anyone even knowing about its existence? One has to think that this place is similar to Area 51 in America. I personally wouldn't be surprised if Russia is still using this as a spot to do some really scary and, and probably pretty questionable experiments without anybody knowing. Those could involve aliens, genetic mutations, maybe even advanced weaponry development. It's hard to say truly what's going on at this place and it's likely that Russia kind of wants to keep it that way. Number five on this list is Heard Island. Heard Island is actually part of Australia even though it is super far away from Australia. The travel says one of the most remote territories in the world, Heard Island is considered an Australian territory even though it's located between Madagascar and Antarctica. It's home to a wide range of animals such as seals, penguins, and marine birds, as well as more than 40 glaciers. There were a few reasons for closing the island to the public. First, in 2000, researchers noticed a huge lava flow coming from the island's massive volcano called Mawson's Peak. 
Second, Heard Island is known for its poor weather conditions. And third, it's too remote to be safe. Judge it by yourself, it's located in a minimum two week sail to the closest major landmass. So yeah, there are obviously tons of reasons not to go to this place and very few reasons to actually go. And the few reasons to actually go, it would be pretty cool to go to a place that's totally remote like this. There'd be a lot of penguins and seals and stuff and for about a solid half hour, you would think it's pretty cool. After that half hour though, I don't think that you'd be about it. The weather is horrible here and it's going to be extremely cold. So you could easily get swept up in a bad storm that would make it impossible to leave the island. This is also one of the better case scenarios because alternatively, you could have the volcano erupt. On the bright side, you wouldn't be cold anymore if that happened, but you'd also be very dead. I also looked at some pictures of this place online and honestly guys, there really isn't that much to it. Like if the place was like picturesque and there was beautiful stuff here, then I could see an argument for it, but that's actually just not the case. Like it's kind of just a small plot of land in the middle of nowhere. And even by looking at the photos, I felt like I was getting cold. The island is banned for a reason, so stay away guys. Number four on this list is Monkey Island. As far as islands packed with animals, you're going to see that this isn't actually the scariest one on the list but still, it's pretty dangerous. The travel says a colony of approximately 4,000 rhesus monkeys live on Morgan Island, South Carolina, due to which it was nicknamed as Monkey Island. But despite what you might think, the population of primates isn't native to the island. They were relocated there from Puerto Rico due to the spreading of herpes virus B infection. Before it happened, the island was uninhabited. These days, people are prohibited by law to visit the island for their own safety as well as the safety of the monkeys. Only a handful of researchers from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases can go there. So herpes virus B is very dangerous, guys. A lot of people think herpes and think of cold sores and you know, well, not a major deal, but herpes virus B, that is a very rare infection that can lead to permanent brain damage or death if you don't seek doctor's help immediately. So basically, this island is filled with a bunch of monkeys who by themselves could be very dangerous because they could attack us at any time, but also a lot of these monkeys happen to carry a very dangerous infection. So for a good reason, the government has completely banned people from going. If you care about your health and safety, you should listen to them. Number three on this list is Snake Island. So we had Monkey Island, now this is Snake Island. Just the name Snake Island sounds scary as hell. Sounds like something that you'd hear about in a Scooby-Doo novel, let alone in real life. AZ Animal says, Ilha da Quimera Grande is home to Bothrops insularis. It's also known as the Golden Lancehead Viper. This snake is a relative of the mainland's deadliest snake, the Fer de Lance. This snake is very noteworthy because it exists only on Snake Island. There's no other place on Earth that you can find this animal. The prevailing theory is that this species became trapped on the island after the last ice age ended over 11,000 years ago. Rising seawater immersed the land, connecting Snake Island to the mainland. The golden lance head is very distinct. The snake has a light yellow and light brown color, especially on its underside. Also, this snake shares the same unique head as the Fer de Lance, a long head with a point at the nose that resembles a lance's blade. The golden lance head snake is one of the most venomous snakes in South America. The mortality rate for people that get anti-venom is believed to be up to 3%, and that number skyrockets if you don't get treatment. Even if the individual does not die, they will suffer severe damage to their body. The venom of a golden lance head is hemotoxic. That means it attacks red blood cells and can cause all sorts of different physical problems. If a golden lance head bites you, you will suffer from pain, internal bleeding, necrosis of muscle tissue, possible hemorrhages in the brain, and way too many other symptoms. There's a very famous story associated with this island where a lighthouse keeper and his family went here and when people went to go check up on them a bit later, they were all dead from snake bites. 
Then a few other people tried to go here and they all died from snake bites too. Apparently this island is so dense with snakes that wherever you go, you have a high chance of getting bit. For people's safety, they obviously had to shut it down in the public. Number two on this list is Mezgori. This banned location is in Russia and if you go here, you are probably never coming back out again. The travel says, being the largest country in the world, Russia is certainly full of surprises. Has a lot of mysterious sites, ghost towns, and other special places. Like for example, Mezgori in the Republic of Bashkorstan. It's a closed town hidden somewhere in the southern Ural Mountains. To keep off anyone who wants to penetrate into the town or even come close to it, it's encircled by two battalions. It's not 100% clear what this area is and why it's surrounded, but it's got a lot of secrecy. According to most believable reports, it's a nuclear missile site that allegedly has automatic missiles that can be controlled remotely. But since government officials don't comment anything on it, we still can't be sure what's going on there. Man, you already know that if you go anywhere close to this secret Russia, base that it is guaranteed to be the last thing you do. Also, people are just guessing it's nukes, but it honestly could be something way worse than that too. Like this could totally be some evil human crossbreeding mutation lab or something like that. Or a place where they're just developing like super secret advanced weaponry that's just too crazy to comprehend. Whatever they are truly doing here, none of us will ever be allowed to find out because it is thoroughly off limits. And number one on this list is Poveglia. Poveglia is an island in Italy that has seen its fair share of death and tragedy. Mental Floss says Poveglia in Italy is deserted today, but it's been said that over the years 160,000 people have lived and died there. The Venetian island became a quarantine station in 1793 and for two decades it was a place for potential victims of the bubonic plague. So many people died there that up to 50% of the island's soil is said to contain human remains. The quarantine station closed in 1814, but Poveglia's dark history didn't end there. A mental hospital opened at the site in the 1920s and it quickly developed a reputation for its inhumane treatment of patients. The hospital closed after a few decades and today the overgrown island is largely closed off to visitors except for the occasional ghost hunters. Think about how much death has happened here. All of that death is what has led people to the conclusion that this place, it's haunted. And not just a little bit haunted, like I am talking deeply haunted. I mean half the time that you take a step, you're going to be walking over someone's dead body. This is just bound to be a spot of paranormal activity. The government has rightfully shut this place down. Unless you're a professional ghost hunter, you should not be visiting Poveglia. Kicking off at number five, the Long U Caves. And this place in particular is absolutely mind blowing given the fact that if it was indeed made by human civilization, then we've got to really take a look at how capable our ancient ancestors actually were at building things. Picture this, in 1992 in the small Chinese village of Long Yu, the locals had lived for centuries besides a small series of ponds that littered the landscape. Local legend believed that these ponds were bottomless, infinite wild of water, but one local in particular named Wu and I set out to put that legend to the test. After pooling his money together with another villager, he purchased a pump and completely drained one of the ponds and that's when Wu and I discovered that it wasn't a pond at all, but instead the flooded entrance to an ancient series of man-made caves. But when I say caves, I don't just mean a few interesting holes in the earth, I mean hand-carved caves, each the size of roughly 1,000 square meters, reaching up to heights of up to 100 feet. Inside, the ceilings, the walls, the pillars that maintain their structural integrity were all finished in the exact same manner, hand carved with a series of parallel bands and intricate markings. Now no one has any clue how the hell these caves were created or who created them, but researchers have found that they date back to at least 220 BCE, a period that predates the ancient Qin dynasty, although no trace of their construction or even their existence has ever been located in the historic record. In fact, up until their discovery in 1992, the Longyu caves were forgotten to the sands of time. It makes you think, what else is lurking down there, right? 
Coming in next at number four, Petra. And yes, of course, this is the scene that I was alluding to in our opening clip. The ancient city of Petra, described by UNESCO as one of the most precious cultural properties of mankind's cultural heritage, and perhaps one of the most amazing archaeological wonders on this fair planet. This place is fascinating, and it's a monument to the fact that we really have no idea how capable humanity has been for thousands upon thousands of years. Petra, originally known to its inhabitants as Rakmu, is believed to have been settled perhaps as early as 9000 BC. BC, although earlier estimations have been suggested. However, by the 5th century BC, it is believed that the city of Petra itself was settled by the mysterious Nabataean Kingdom, an ancient conglomerate of Bedouin tribes that were incredibly astute traders and economists who, for the most part, were a nomadic people but recognized the significance of Petra's geographical location. And for the most part, that was fit exactly for Petra's purpose, as it quickly became a massive central hub for trading routes across the world, gaining the Nabataean Kingdom incredible wealth in the process. But I mean, you just need to look at Petra to start scratching your head at the incredible intricacies of its design. I don't say this lightly because the Rose City of Petra is an absolutely stunning feat of engineering at a time when nomadic societies weren't exactly known for their capability in raising wonders of the world. So, how was it built? Well, the leading theory so far is that the Nabataean people harnessed the location susceptibility to flash flooding, gradually carving the narrow passages into the city like network that we now know. Either way, Whatever the truth to it, Petra is an ancient wonder to behold. Oh, and also archaeologists have just discovered that there's a gigantic monumental structure buried beneath the sands of Petra. So yeah, do with that information as you will. Swinging in next at number three, Derinkuyu Underground City. And if things weren't already crazy enough, what if I told you that there is an ancient, highly advanced underground complex carved beneath the central Anatolian city of Derinkuyu in Turkey that is believed to have been large enough to have sheltered up to 20,000 people and more than likely connect several other similar underground complexes across the ancient historical site of Cappadocia. Yeah. My thoughts exactly. Um, I don't even know where to begin with this one because as the eons of time have slowly shifted by, countless people have taken shelter within Derin Kuyu, using it as their home across the ages, and because of that, it's incredibly difficult to pinpoint just exactly when it was built. Its purpose, however, is relatively clear. It's a multi level city built underground, carved from the soft volcanic rock of the region. It consists of 18 stories that descend deep into the earth, comprised of sophisticated carved shafts that house the complex multitude of amenities, communal rooms, wine cellars, oil presses, stables, even entire chapels. Each floor of the city can be closed off by a series of large stone doors, which in theory makes it some kind of ancient underground bunker given the other facilities gathered over time. Historically speaking, the Phrygians of the 8th century BCE were the first alleged inhabitants of the vast underground city. Although the fact of the matter remains, we may never truly know who built this place. Scholars have given many suggestions, primarily being a sect of the ancient Persians or the Hittites, but I'm not entirely sure. Put a pin in this one because there are many, many more secrets to be learned from this. Next up at number two, Nan Madol. And what if I told you that this place in particular was the source of inspiration for none other than HP Lovecraft's sunken city of Rillier? As in, yes, in his house at Rillier, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. That one. But if that's not impressive enough, the ancient megalithic architecture of Nan Madol, just off the coast of the island of Pyongpei, which is part of the remote islands of Micronesia, are something else entirely. And really, I don't know what to think when it comes to trying to decipher the eternal enigma that is Nan Madol, often referred to as the eighth wonder of the world. There's a reason it has left archaeologists scratching their heads ever since its rediscovery in the early 19th century. Now, carbon dating has indicated that the construction of the massive basalt stones of Nan Madol began sometime in 1180. AD, although many scholars find umbrage with this, given the fact that to move these giant hunks of rock from tiny island to tiny island and then carve them into a series of intricate channels and platforms is a feat in and of itself. Its purpose is somewhat clear though. Nan Madol appeared to have housed the ruling elite caste of the ancient Sudilaire dynasty of Pyongpei, where it was used as a political and ceremonial seat of power, essentially housing a vast network of small floating platforms and islands that formed into a rich, majestic capital city carved from black stone. Stone. Yeah, I don't want to make any assumptions, but there are many, many more answers to be revealed by Nan Madol, and it's no wonder that Lovecraft himself found an ancient kind of inspiration from it. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the Sahama Lines. And whilst you more than definitely have probably already heard of the Nazca Lines of Peru, I'm going to go one further and highlight the equally perplexing mystery that is the Sahama Lines of Western Bolivia, because boy, oh boy, are these things a head scratcher. The Sahama Lines are a network of thousands, possibly 
possibly tens of thousands of perfectly straight paths that were etched into the ground by the indigenous peoples of the Americas for more than 3,000 years that were situated near the volcano of Sahama. Unlike the Nazca lines though, this particular network covers an area of over 22,500 square kilometers, which is approximately 15 times larger than their counterparts in Peru. And what are they? Well, no one knows, and we may never know, but what is clear is the startling precision in which they were made. These thousands of individual lines, each 3 to 10 feet in width, are almost perfectly straight, mile after mile, despite the ever changing rugged terrain of the highlands, which would have been quite a feat for modern humanity, never mind an ancient indigenous people without the means to advance construction techniques. These geoglyphs were most likely created through the process of scraping away the dark, oxidized rock of the volcanic surface to reveal a lighter sediment beneath. You see, despite all of these enigmas of ancient history, the real question is why did these people go to such lengths of time and effort to create them? What were their intentions of preservation? Who would have seen them or used them? Now there are many leading theories, the most prominent of which is that the Sahama lines were used as a pilgrimage route to a series of sacred sites, but yeah, I have no idea. I really have no idea. I mean, I want to know, but will we ever? Starting off at number 5, the Island of Dolls. Nestled within the waterways just south of Mexico City, lies an island veiled in a chilling mystery, the Island of Dolls. It is a place that resonates with an eerie atmosphere that sends shivers down the spines of those who dare to venture there. It got its name from, well, all the dolls just hanging around on the island, which is so creepy. The Island of Dolls owes its spooky reputation to a tragic legend that took root decades ago. The story goes that a reclusive man named Don Julian Santana once inhabited the island. One fateful day, he stumbled upon the lifeless body of a young girl floating in a nearby canal. Haunted by this grim discovery, and reportedly tormented by her spirit, Santana began to collect discarded and broken dolls from the canals and garbage dumps. As if driven by an inexplicable force, Santana hung these disfigured and weathered dolls from the trees and structures that adorn the island. Each doll with its hollow eyes and decaying limbs became a haunting sentinel, a tribute to the spirit of the lost girl, and a manifestation of Santana's obsession to protect against malevolent forces. Over the years, the island transformed into an unsettling amalgamation of youthful innocence and twisted horror. Countless dolls in various states of decomposition dangle ominously from branches, fences, and makeshift shrines. The air resonates with a cacophony of whispering plastic swaying gently in the wind and casting eerie shadows upon the island's murky landscape. Anyone lucky enough to find the Island of Dolls are met with a startling attack on the senses. Dolls with vacant stares seem to follow your every move, while the creaking of their plastic limbs evokes an unsettling symphony. The rustling leaves and distant echoes only amplify the feeling of being watched by unseen eyes, and a pervasive sense of unease settles in like a thick fog. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Chucky, but I personally am never going to that island. Like. Ever. In a world captivated by the digital and the predictable, the Island of Dolls stands as a testament to the enigmatic and the unknown. Google Maps may lay bare the streets and landmarks of our world, but this haunting isle remains shrouded in the shadows of its own haunting past. Next at number 4, Dracula's Castle. Perched high upon a rugged hill in the heart of Transylvania, Bran Castle stands as a timeless sentinel of history, mystery, and folklore. Its jagged stone walls loom like the teeth of a beast, casting a grand silhouette of a starved monster. Better known as Dracula's castle, this imposing fortress has captured the imagination of generations, spawning theories as to what its origins are, who resides there, and its purpose. Built in the 14th century, Dracula's castle's grim purpose was shrouded in secrecy, its shadowy corridors echoing with whispered tales of unspeakable horrors. Within its heart, a labyrinth of cryptic chambers and chilling catacombs await, a realm where time has danced to a different rhythm, and where the line between reality and the supernatural is irrevocably blurred. A macabre masterpiece of gothic architecture, Bran Castle's towering spires and ominous battlements seem to claw at the heavens, a testament to the power and the darkness that thrives within. As one ventures deeper into its foreboding depths, portraits of ancestral lords and queens gaze down with eyes that follow your every move, their watchful presence hinting at an age-old pact with the undead. Legends whispered in hushed tones speak of secret passages that wind like serpents beneath the castle, hidden alcoves concealing the coffins of the immortal vampires who walk the night. Torchlight dances upon stone walls, casting eerie, dancing shadows that seem to writhe like restless spirits longing for release from their eternal rest. Outside, the moon 
cast an otherworldly glow upon the desolate landscape, illuminating the ancient cemetery that stretches before the castle's gates. Tombstones, worn with the passage of time, bear cryptic inscriptions that tell of the souls lost and lives extinguished in the name of an insatiable hunger. Within these walls, where the air is full with a scent of ancient evil, one can almost hear the whisper of cape against stone, the faint flutter of wings, and the soft, hypnotic cadence of a heartbeat that defies mortality. It is a place where the legend of Dracula breathes, where the boundary between life and death is a tenuous thread ready to snap at any moment. As the winds howl through the battlements and the moon casts its eerie glow upon the castle's spires, one can't help but feel that the veil between the world is at its thinnest here, and that the spirit of the vampire himself may still roam these halls, forever haunting those who dare to tread within the realm of Dracula's castle. At number three, the hanging coffins. In the remote mountain town of Sagata, a chilling testament to ancient rituals and the enigma of death hangs suspended in the misty air. The hanging coffins of Sagata stand as a solemn testament to a practice shrouded in mystique, a sight that both fascinates and unnerves, embodying a profound connection between life, death, and the sacred. Seems to be a lot of hanging objects this episode. Nestled high upon limestone cliffs on the outskirts of the village, these eerie coffins defy gravity, seemingly tethered to the rock face by an otherworldly force. Their presence evokes a somber reminder of the Cordilleran traditions that have endured for generations, a tradition where the deceased are placed in coffins, often carved from hollowed out logs, and suspended on precipitous cliffs to bring them closer to the spirits and the heavens. Approaching this site, one can't help but feel a sense of reverence mixed with trepidation. The air is heavy with the weight of centuries, and the wind carries with it echoes of ancient chants and prayers. The coffins, swaying gently in the breeze, serve as a poignant reminder of the fragility of existence, reminder that even in death, our connection to the world endures. The cliffside cemetery stands as a silent congregation of souls, each coffin etching a story of a life once lived, a tale that becomes intertwined with the very landscape that cradles them. It's a sight that ignites the imagination, prompting thoughts of the rituals, beliefs, and ceremonies that once accompanied these solemn placements. As the sun sets over the horizon, casting an amber glow upon the hanging coffins, one can almost feel the spirits of the departed drawing near, a presence that transcends reason. It's a place where the barrier between the living and the dead becomes tantalizingly thin, where the echoes of ages past resound like the ringing of a distant bell. Speaking of bells, why don't you guys subscribe and press the notification bell if you're enjoying the video? Just, just a thought. Let's take a trip to Japan for number two, Scarecrow Village. In the hidden valleys of Shikoku, Japan, a village lies frozen in a paradoxical tableau of the eerie and the quaint. Nagoro, often referred to as the Scarecrow Village, exudes an aura of unsettling mystery, where straw-filled figures stand as eerie sentinels, guarding secrets that lie beneath the surface, their unsettling appearance striking terror into the hearts of passerbys and locals alike. Approaching Nagoro is like stepping into a nightmarish realm that lies on the fringes of reality. The scarecrows, twisted and contorted into eerie facsimiles of human life, populate every nook and cranny of the village. They leer from windows, hunch over fields, and gather in unsettling congregations as if in some twisted ritual. Their presence is suffocating, a constant reminder that in Nagoro, there is always someone or something watching you. In the fading light, the scarecrows take on an eldritch quality, their straw forms casting elongated, contorted shadows that writhe and twist like tortured souls. And as night descends, a sense of impending doom envelops Nagoro, as the simulacrums of straw disappear into the darkness. And trust me, when you're in Nagoro, it's a whole lot scarier not to see them than to see them, because even if you can't see them, they can see you. Nagoro, the scarecrow village, beckons to those who seek to pierce the veil between the mortal and the malevolent. It is a place where the mundane has been transmuted into something sinister, where the boundary between life and death is a fragile barrier ready to be breached. Number one, the catacombs of Paris. Beneath the bustling veneer of Paris's grandeur, a sinister underworld waits to ensnare those who dare to venture into its Stygian depths. The catacombs of Paris, a subterranean labyrinth woven with the threads of history and the shadows of the departed, beckon with an alluring yet chilling embrace, an invitation to confront the enigma of mortality itself. Once echoing with a cacophony of quarrying, these catacombs devolve into a sepulchral sanctuary during the late 18th century, a haunting solution to Paris's overflowing cemeteries. They became a grim receptacle for the bones of the long forgotten. Descending into the Stygian abyss is akin to stepping into the yawning maw of the abyss itself, where time has been swallowed whole and the air seems to pulse with an otherworldly heartbeat. Illuminated by mere feeble torchlight, the catacombs reveal a ghastly tapestry of the dead, an intricate symphony of stacked bones and skulls that form eerie patterns upon the walls. The corridors, lined with the remnants of countless lives, are a spectral testament to humanity's ultimate fate, a silent congregation that lingers on the precipice 
precipice between the world of the living and the realm of the lost. Amidst the chilling silence, an infamous tale whispers through the catacombs, a story that has woven itself into the fabric of the labyrinth itself. The Philibur Asper incident tells of a daring cataphile, a catacomb explorer who vanished without a trace within this subterranean maze. His torchlight flickered out, his voice was swallowed by the darkness, and his footsteps vanished into the abyss. Despite extensive searches, his fate remains a haunting mystery, a cryptic riddle that the catacombs themselves seem to guard with an eerie resolve. As you traverse the subterranean passageways, a chilling resonance permeates the air. The echoing whispers of souls long departed, their murmurs a cryptic riddle that teases the fringes of your perception. The oppressive atmosphere seems to bear witness to the weight of the secrets entombed within, leaving you with an unsettling sense of being watched by unseen eyes that linger just beyond the flickering light. The catacombs of Paris draw you into their depths, ensnaring your senses with an aura of morbid fascination. As you tread on the same ground that countless others have traversed on their final journey, a shiver courses down your spine, a spectral caress from phantoms of the past, a reminder that mortality's grip is inescapable, and that the boundary between life and death is a mere veil that flutters in the darkness. Emerging from the catacombs, you carry with you the weight of an experience that defies explanation, an encounter with the mysteries that lie beneath the surface, a communion with the souls that linger in the shadows. The catacombs of Paris beckon, a cryptic siren's call that invites you to traverse the threshold into the unknown, to embrace the darkness that resides within us all, and to confront the mysteries that dwell in the subterranean depths of the human psyche. Number five on this list is Don Stay La Kang. This temple is located in Bhutan, an often overlooked nation that's nestled between Nepal, Bangladesh, and China. This nation is largely populated with Buddhist monks and is known for its monasteries, fortresses, and incredible landscape. The country itself is already shrouded in mystery, and this place is probably the best example of that. Holidify writes, Dung Stay Lak Hong was built by the Thang Tong Jialpo in the year 1433. It's said that the monument was constructed on the body of a monster that was causing harm to the inhabitants. There are mysterious stories about this place, and locals believe that the divine power of the temple would retain the demon from coming back to life. The building is in the form of a diagram mandala and different floors represent the earth, the heaven, and hell. The horror-inspired frescoes on the walls leave visitors dazzled and add to the mystic charm of this place. Dung Stay Lak Hang is carefully preserved and it requires special permission from the authorities to get into the landmark. Any place that's guarded heavily like this and not allowing the public, plus it has deep ties to the devil and hell, obviously needs to make the list. Also, the entire legend surrounding it where it was built on the body of a monster already adds to the mystery surrounding this spot. Stories have come out of this place with some of the very few people who have been inside of it being met with spiritual visitors. Potentially this strange temple is actually a portal of sorts to connect us of the living world to those of the dead. It's impossible to say, but it also doesn't help that the authorities won't let us in to explore it. If you do manage to find a way inside, then you'll need to bring a flashlight though. There's no lights in this place at all, and it's said to be completely dark on the inside, which just adds to the mystery again. Number 4 on this list is the Plain of the Jars. Located in Laos, this site is definitely a weird one. A bunch of stone jars, 2,000 of them to be exact, all scattered throughout the fields of this hilly terrain. These jars are very sizable and made of pure rock. In fact, the word jars is pretty generous because it's basically just a bunch of rocks with holes on the top of them. What they're used for, who put them here, and how they got here though are all a big mystery. Maybe the most interesting thing about these jars is the story with World War II. In World War II, the site in question was heavily bombed. One would imagine that some stones with holes in them would be obliterated from a heavy barrage of bombs, but they weren't. In fact, it didn't look like they took any damage at all. Some people believe this is because these jars have a deep spiritual connection to them. This lends itself to the origin of these jars where people think that they were used for some interesting sacrificial rituals. Granted, some other people believe that they were used to make wine. A bunch of jars to sacrifice people or a bunch of jars to get drunk off of. I guess you guys be the judge. Number three on this list is the Ryukyu Islands. These islands are a chain of islands that are located off of Japan. The islands, although they're very beautiful and have some amazing scenery, aren't really mysterious in their own right. It's what's located in the water beneath them though that has a lot of mystery and lore surrounding it. Under the water of the Ryukyu Islands are what many believe to be an Atlantis-like city. 
It was discovered in 1995, so very recently considering human history. At first this ancient city was thought to be just a naturally formed monument. A rock formation that just happened to be thrown together by the earth underwater. However, as more experts looked at it, the theory that it was man-made started to gain a lot of traction. It's a mysterious pyramid looking structure that nobody can really explain. Nobody knows how it got there or what it was used for if it was man made. Also think about it if it actually was man made like people are suggesting. Either we made it underwater which makes absolutely no sense at all or we made it so long ago that the water levels rose over top of it. Meaning that we're talking about something thousands and thousands of years old. What the heck were these people building here thousands and thousands of years ago and why were they doing it? Number two on this list is the Mustang Caves. These are absolutely wild caves and really don't make a lot of sense. Tripoto says, being one of the world's greatest archeological mysteries, the Mustang Caves lie in one of the most remote and isolated regions in the Himalayas. The landscape is unlike anything else found in Nepal, with strangely sculptured rock formations comprised of nearly 10,000 den openings perched more than 150 feet above the ground. It's unknown who dug them since whoever did would have had to scale a near vertical rock to do so, a task almost impossible to accomplish by even experienced climbers. No one knows what their purpose was either with theories ranging from living quarters to burial chambers. A visit to this mysterious spot will definitely leave you amazed and equally confused. These caves literally make zero sense guys. It is straight up a cave inside of a mountain. Like how on earth do you get to that place on the mountain of the cliff face to begin with and then once you're there, how do you dig a massive hole to get these caves? Explorers have found mummified bodies in these caves before that can be dated back to 3000 years ago. That is a long time ago when people wouldn't have presumably had the technology capable of constructing things like this. There's also been a lot of sculptures, paintings, and other things found in these caves. However, none of what has been found indicates which group is responsible for making these things in the first place. They also don't know why they're there either. It's possible that these were just burial sites, but it also seems like overkill to build these cliff caves for just something like that. Others have speculated that these spots are used to practice advanced tantric yoga or back in the day perform some sort of ancient rituals. It's likely that we won't ever know the full purpose. And number one on this list is Fengdu. Fengdu, or better known as the City of Ghosts, is one of the most spiritually connected places in the world. Atlas Obscura says, The city has been around for nearly 2,000 years, filling it with a spooky sense of the past. Its origin story begins back in the Han Dynasty when two officials decided to run away to the area and live out their lives where they eventually, the story goes, became immortal. Yin and Wang, the names of the officials, were combined during a later dynasty to mean King of the Underworld. Most of the popular landmarks in the City of Ghosts have names that reference the afterlife. Last Glance at Home Tower, Nothing to be Done Bridge, Ghost Torturing Pass. Covering the sites are statues and other artistic depictions of ghosts and devils, terrifying works that represent what happens to those who haven't lived good lives after theirs is taken from them. Less popular, but no less fascinating, is the theme park haunted house made to represent the terrors within the afterlife, complete with neon paint and vendors hawking scream masks alongside an alleyway. The giant face seen in the hill is called the Ghost King and it holds the Guinness World Records title as the biggest sculpture carved on a rock. At 138 meters tall and about 217 meters wide, the Ghost King can be seen from all around the city. It's believed that every single person who dies must pass through this city before reaching the full afterlife. In this city are three tests for these souls. Wikipedia says that first they must pass the Bridge of Helplessness. This stone bridge was built during the Ming Dynasty and is a test for good and evil. It has three arches and only the middle one is used for testing people. There are different protocols for crossing the bridge depending on sex, age, marital status. At the bridge, demons allow or forbid passage. The good are allowed to pass while the evil will be pushed to the water below. This is now done as a tourist attraction and performers characterized as demons momentarily stop tourists on the bridge but 
finally allow them access. Then the dead must proceed to Ghost Torturing Pass where they present themselves for judgment before Yan Lao Wang. This is the second test. In this area there are large sculptures of demons. The third test is done at the entrance of Tianzi Palace where the dead must stand on a certain stone on one foot for three minutes. According to legend a virtuous person will be able to do it while an evil person will fail and be condemned to hell. Clearly a super mysterious spot that you probably weren't supposed to see until you die. Number 5. Magnetic Hills There are several roads in this world that seem to defy the laws of gravity. They've been given many names. Gravity Hills, Magnetic Hills, Magic Hills, you get it, they're special hills. Cars that are put into neutral on these hills will roll uphill like they're being pulled by a magnet. There are dozens of dedicated sites for people to go to and test these hills out for themselves. Every single continent has more than one, so if you feel the urge to fall uphill, go check them out. Maybe before I explain how they work, so that you retain some amazement and mystery in the moment. So how is this possible? Well, like I hinted at earlier, the hill only appears to be uphill. It's not an actual incline. The surrounding land creates an optical illusion, and our feeble human brains are unable to process that fact. So we truly believe that we are going uphill. I mean, that's the basic gist, but I'm assuming, like me, you guys are going to want a little bit of a more in-depth explanation. Well, too bad. You don't get one. Kidding. You do. Of course you do. And you're definitely not here to listen to me ramble, so I'll get back on track. In 2003, researchers conducted a study into why exactly our brains process these hills as uphill. They looked into how the absence of a horizon can skew perspective on gravity hills. Scientists at universities in Europe figured out that without a true horizon in sight, our brain will try to fill in the blanks and will interpret our environment based on the landmarks around us. Our brain uses the surrounding landmarks like trees and buildings, which are able to trick our eyes. For example, if everything around you is tilted just slightly, you'd assume that you're on a slant or going uphill. It's kind of like those rooms that make one person seem huge and another seem tiny. It's all based on perspective. Even though there is proven scientific reasoning behind these magical hills, many continue to create theories and stories surrounding what else could possibly be causing the hills to defy the rules of physics. Initially, people were shocked, thinking that someone had stolen their car or bike when they would return to find it gone. Theories about the hills being magnetic and pulling cars with metal under the surface of the roads also gained traction. Of course, some thought that the cars were actually defying gravity due to a glitch in the matrix or from a magical force. But we know a lot more now, and after experiencing the hills, people are usually inclined to believe the scientific reasoning. But still, it would feel insanely cool to travel uphill with negative resistance. So hey, search up the closest gravity hill to you, grab a level, jump in your car, and roll up a hill. Number 4. Sailing Stones Can inanimate objects move on their own? It appears they can. Sailing stones are an incredible phenomena where large rocks and stones are able to travel far distances without anyone moving them. The stones leave behind a trail in the sand, as though someone had dragged them through it, but there's no footprints left behind. They actually do move without any human or animal interaction. Instead, the nature and environment around them moves them. But how? Many thought that a supernatural force was responsible for the movement, like a ghost, or that the rocks themselves were creatures. I guess, like the trolls from Frozen, but really slow. The first documented sighting of these rocks was in 1915, when Joseph Crook visited the racetrack playa site. He noticed that the rocks had shifted, seemingly by themselves. Disagreements over the origin of the moving rocks began to spark, leading people to conduct their own studies in different locations where the phenomena occurred. In 1952, a great deal of attention was brought to the rocks when Life magazine wrote a piece on them. People hypothesized that the rocks were being moved by strong gusts of wind when the ground was muddy. In 1955, geologist George Stanley wrote a paper criticizing the theory. Stanley reminded theorists that the rocks were at times heavier than a grown man, so the wind alone would not have been able to push the rocks, and the mud would have just made it more difficult difficult for the rocks to move. Instead, he offered a theory, which is the basis of the theory we use today. Ice sheets around the stones helped to catch the wind, which initiated the movement of the rocks. 
The stones are classified as a geological phenomenon. Movement of the rocks occurs when thin sheets of ice floating on a short lasting winter pond break up in the sun's heat. The rocks are released and able to float off the soft bed of sand which reduces friction. Then the rocks are pushed around by the wind, even a very soft, almost non-existent wind, because the friction between the rock and the ground is so minimal. The rocks have been recorded moving distances of over 200 meters. They occur in many different places, but Death Valley in California is definitely the location where the most sightings have been. Honestly, I would be pretty terrified if I had a run in with these rocks before I knew the scientific reasoning. I mean, imagine camping and waking up to an army of rocks surrounding you. I'd assume I was about to be the human sacrifice for some sort of desert cult. Number three, kindred downfall or upfall. Now I'm sure you've heard of a waterfall, but have you ever heard of a water climb? You probably haven't because I just made that word up. And as you can tell, I'm very proficient in wordplay. I'm talking about the opposite of a waterfall where water goes upwards instead of falling into a body of water below. The phenomena doesn't consistently occur. Like it's not a continuous stream of water climbing upwards. Sorry, I made it seem like it was on purpose. Instead, the phenomena has certain seasons and weather conditions that cause it to occur. Strong winds, which occur more often depending on the season, push the water upwards, but only for short periods of time. The wind has to be really strong though, at least 70 kilometers an hour for this phenomena to occur. They've been observed in Australia, India, Japan, the UK, the US, and really anywhere with winds strong enough to create them. The most powerful and popular reverse waterfall exists in Maharashtra, India. It is called the Nanagat Waterfall and it is considered the best place in the world to catch a reverse waterfall in action. The ideal time to observe it is during monsoon season. April to September. And anyone longing to view the climbing water must be extremely prepared, as it is not an easy task. First, you must go to Mumbai, and then drive three hours to the Nanagat Pass. Then you would hike through forested terrain for four to five hours. But remember, if you're going to see this waterfall during its peak activity, the weather is going to be rough. So you'll need to prepare all of your equipment for the weather conditions. But then you will be able to witness the phenomena firsthand. And I'm sure the view would make the trek well worth it. Hopefully you don't run into any of the deadly wildlife India has lurking in their forests. I love the outdoors and I'm convinced that I'm an animal whisperer, so I'd definitely be fine. But if you decided to make the trek, hire a guide. Don't go at it alone. You're not as delusional as I am. Number two, Giant's Causeway. Ireland is known for the intense beauty that their country holds. And though I haven't been there personally, I know many people who have, and they would wholeheartedly agree with the observation. One of the most drop dead startling sights that you can see in Ireland is the massive collection of columns forged by none other than the wonderful mother nature and maybe some angry giants. The Giant's Causeway is an area of over 40,000 interlocking basalt columns. Most of the columns are hexagonal, but the number of sides does differ. The tallest columns are over 35 feet tall. But how did this wonder of the world come to be? Well, let's travel all the way back to the Paleocene Epoch. That's 50 to 60 million years ago. Due to intense volcanic activity, highly fluid molten basalt intruded through chalk beds to form a volcanic plateau. When the lava cooled, it contracted, allowing it to form into the columns. The size of each was determined by the speed the lava cooled at. The fragmenting and cracking during the cooling process is what created the columns we now see. The columns also have legends attached to them, which are actually responsible for the name of the site. Some believe that the columns were the remains of a causeway built by giants. Causeways are railroads on elevated pieces of land, usually surrounded by water. The legend tells the story of Finn McCool being challenged to a fight against a Scottish giant named Ben and Donner. Finn accepted and built the causeway so the two could meet up and fight. In one version of the story, Finn beats Ben and Donner, but in another, Finn hides when he realizes that Ben and Donner is much bigger than him. Finn's wife disguises him as a baby, and when Ben and Donner sees the size of the baby, he figures that the father must be a colossal giant. Then Ben and Donner flees back to Scotland, destroying the causeway behind him in fear that he may be followed. The giant causeway is located off the north coast of Northern Ireland, and it is free to visit, minus the plane, the hotel, transportation, you know, but the, the view is still free. In 2019, over 998,000 people visited the columns. They're definitely a strange and popular attraction and absolutely high on my bucket list. 
Number one, Hudson Bay, Canada. Did you ever try to play the game Light as a Feather? You know that slumber party game where you'd all sit in a circle and try to lift a person up with your fingertips while eerily chanting, light as a feather, stiff as a board? I'm sure you know it. And I'm assuming that it never worked out the way you'd hoped. Well, if you want some help, consider heading over to Hudson Bay, Canada, where scientists say the gravitational pull is lower than anywhere else on Earth. Yep, you heard me right. The gravitational pull in Hudson Bay, Canada is the lowest in the world. People actually weigh less there. It was first discovered in the 1960s, when global gravity fields were being charted. Scientists were baffled by this phenomena. And to most, it doesn't seem possible for there to be less gravity anywhere on Earth. Researchers studied for over 40 years in order to understand the phenomenon. And, well, they believe they found an answer. The basic idea is that gravity on the surface of the Earth varies depending on the mass of the Earth in said location. The cause of less mass in Hudson's Bay is explained by two theories, the Laurentide Ice Sheet Theory and the Mantle Theory. The Mantle Theory is about, well, Earth's mantle. The mantle is a layer of molten rock, magma, between 100 kilometers and 200 kilometers down below the surface of the Earth. The magma causes convection currents, which drag the Earth's continental sheets down, and then, you guessed it, decreases the mass, which decreases the gravity. The second theory assumes that Earth's mass is lighter in Hudson's Bay because of a giant ice sheet, named the Laurentide Ice Sheet. During the Ice Age, the entire country was covered by an extremely thick glacier, about 3.2 kilometers thick in most places, and over 3.7 kilometers thick in two places over Hudson's Bay. It was so heavy that it squeezed down on the rocks and the earth that were trying their hardest to support it. When the ice began melting, the earth tried to return to its previous state, but it took a while. If you need a visual example, find some memory foam and a finger. Imagine your finger is the ice and poke the foam. The foam will attempt to spring back into its original form, but it takes a while. And that's what the earth was and is still trying to do. But it's not as quick as memory foam. The slow regeneration eventually led to a decrease in the mass of rocks in Hudson's Bay. And well, the decrease of mass came with a decrease of gravity. The Earth regains less than half an inch of mass in the affected areas each year, and it's estimated that it has to rebound 650 feet to return to its original condition. So, safe to say the gravity is going to take a little while to get back to normal. You'll have plenty of time to traverse into the dangerous waters, and even though it might be scary, you'll definitely feel a weight being lifted off your shoulders. Number five, Fengdu Ghost City. Fengdu Ghost City, well, right off the bat, I feel like this is probably a spooky place. You don't name cities Ghost City unless there's a good reason for it. Well, the good reason is that the city got its name during the Eastern Han Dynasty. Two imperial nobles, Yin Changshen and Wang Fengpin, came to Ming Mountain to discover a way to achieve immortality. Combining their two names, Yin and Wang, Ying Wang, translates to King of Hell, and that cemented the site as an underworld hotspot. Since then, the place was built to be a shrine to the underworld world with several temples showing paintings and sculptures of people being punished for their sins and cast into eternal damnation. It's pretty spooky, but honestly, it's pretty cool. It's good craftsmanship. And there is some rich folklore to go with the place. Chinese mythology and beliefs say that the dead must pass three tests before they're allowed to cross into the underworld, which sounds exhausting to me. I can't even enjoy the relief of death before you're asked to solve some riddles and pass some tests. The village is kind of like a place to conduct these tests, and now you can actually go to it yourself and do it as a tourist to and watch performers act out all the trials. But here's the trials. The first test is passing the Bridge of Helplessness, which does sound a little bit like it's from one of the Dark Souls games. It was built during the Ming Dynasty, and good souls are allowed to pass, while evil ones will fall into the water below. Then, you proceed to Ghost Torturing Pass, well that's a fun place to be, where they present themselves for judgement. Finally, the last test is at the entrance to Tianzi Palace, where the ghost must stand on a certain stone on one foot for three minutes straight. I don't know why I'm standing on one foot when the camera is above my waist. You can't tell what I'm doing. I could be standing on as many feet as I want. A good soul will be able to do it, an evil one will fall over. Now this site now is a popular tourist destination due to its very unique structures and fascinating, if not a little bit horrifying decor. I'd I'd want one of those little statues maybe have in my house. I think they're kind of cool, to be honest. And if you're looking for more hellish haunted spots, terrifying tales of poltergeists, ghosts, ghouls, cryptids, aliens, and all kind of freaks under the sun and above it, while well, Top 5 Scary is simply the only place to be. Subscribe and stay scared. Number 4, Kaishiku Grounds. 
If you go to Kaishiku today, you probably wouldn't think much of it at all. The uh, most notable thing around there is a subway station, and aside from that, there's a vegetable market outside, and you can probably score a pretty decent deal on corn. But if you visited Kaishiku back in the 19th century, however, when it served as an execution grounds for prisoners, you probably wouldn't feel too welcome. Thousands of prisoners were brought to the Kaishiku grounds to serve out their last moments. Every autumn, prisoners were taken through the Zuan Women, which earned the fun nickname, the Gate of death at dawn. Awesome. The doomed would then be lined up east to west, their necks stretched by rope to make it easier to chop. Well, that's good. We always want to make it as easy as possible for the guy chopping necks. A singular chop to the neck was considered the easy way out of a one-way trip to Kaishiku. Prisoners accused of more serious crimes would be sentenced to Lingchi, which was a horrid punishment of slowly slicing someone many, many, many many times, leading to it sensationally being dubbed the death of a thousand cuts by outsiders. These executions were designed to be a public spectacle, something for everybody to come and enjoy, something for the whole family to do when no good movies were playing. Kaishiku was one of the busiest intersections in the outer city of Beijing, so crowds would gather to see these things. Most horrifically about this though, is that sometimes the prisoners who were executed, their bodies were photographed and made into postcards. Given this sordid history, is it much of a surprise at all? that passers-by and visitors claim that they can sometimes see ghostly apparitions making their way through the dark hours of the night, or that you can hear screams at all hours? If you ever visit Beijing and make a stop by Kaishiku, take a photo. The, uh, the postcards they sell in the gift shop are a little, uh, dicey. Number three, the Forbidden City. The Forbidden City. Well, that tracks. That sounds very forbidden. Well, back in the 14th century, when it stood as the heart of the Ming Dynasty and served as an imperial palace, yeah, you'd have a pretty difficult time getting access if you were but a common serf like myself. But I think they've relaxed their stance just a little bit because I found more than a few Google recommended articles for tourist things to do in the Forbidden City. I think they just charge like price of admission now. So it's actually very easy to get into the Forbidden City and the Chinese government does know about this. So the formerly Forbidden City, which is not quite as catchy a name, is a beautiful tourist spot and definitely worth checking out. It's got years upon years of culture and rich history behind it and most importantly it's said to be very haunted. The Forbidden City is a pretty credible place for a haunting if I must say. Ghosts are said to be born out of a place of malice and the Forbidden City has over 600 years of deaths, assassinations and who knows how many backstabs and plot twists were the intriguer out there. The most recurring ghost story coming out of the Forbidden City though is that there's a ghost of a weeping woman all dressed in white wandering during the dark hours. Following her is a lingering flute playing. Visitors claim at times they see ghost dogs that run through corridors at the edge of the city, digging up ghost bones. Some travelers report feeling an indescribable strangeness while wandering through the temples. Could it just be they're overcome with beauty and majesty of one of the wonders of the world, or is there spectral energy floating through the air? Before we move off on this one, I want you to take a look at this. A travel blog from Vancouver posted about their experiences traveling through the Imperial City. They noted how odd it was that all the doorways had a raised platform. The guide told them that was a way to confuse ghosts to keep them out. They took tons of photos, but only one stood out for them when they came back. See anything suspicious? Like a ghostly figure just kind of hanging right there in the center? Ugh. Number two, Dead Fengmen Village. Coming up next on this list is going to be Fengmen Village. Fengmen Village is sometimes known as Dead Fengmen's Village, which is not exactly the most welcoming name you want to hear, but there's a pretty good reason for it though. The village itself is about as dead as a village can be, long abandoned by an unknown tribe. It's located in the valley of a nameless mountain in northern China's Henan province. An abandoned city left in a nameless mountain. It seems like it's the start of a chosen one, like heroic journey out there, start of a quest. The surrounding landscape is supposedly quite beautiful. A flowing brook, a, a lush forestry and trees and buildings from the Qing dynasty. 39 buildings, 200 rooms, all of them left completely vacant. And the weird part? No one even knows why. There is extremely little information to be found on Fengmen Village. Who lived there, what happened to them, and so on, so on. Making it absolutely rife for urban legends of hauntings and ghosts. It's a fairly popular spot for backpackers and hikers with an interest in the supernatural who are looking to discover something in the lost village. One story tells of a hiker named Matreya who would make expeditions out to Fengmen Village camping alongside the river just outside with a few companions. On one of his treks, he got the bright idea in the middle of the night to prank his companions by jumping and scaring them, which let me just say, 
I absolutely have to respect that. You're camping out in an abandoned ghost village, you have to seize the opportunity to prank your friends just a little bit. Well, before he got a chance, he got served up his own scare because he swears a discordant, sad sounding voice kept calling his name out over and over in a voice he said he couldn't recognize or had never heard before and none of his friends had any idea what he was talking about. And number one, Chow Nai 81. Our next entry is Chow Nai number 81, a building that has a fairly notable reputation, being listed as the most haunted building in Beijing. It's Beijing's most famous haunted house. The ghost most commonly reported in this house is that of a woman who is the wife of an officer in the National Revolutionary Army during the Chinese Civil War in the late 1940s. He had fled to Taiwan with his compatriots before the end of the war and left his precious wife behind. Naturally, she was pretty upset about this. She was despondent. She felt that without her husband, she had nothing left to live for and thusly took her own life. And her spirit has been trapped in the house ever since. Residents who live around the area claim that during thunderstorms, you can hear shrill, violent screaming coming from inside the house. Visitors report that walking into the house immediately, like immediately, you feel a cold chill come over you and a feeling of inescapable dread. Not good. Not good to feel those things. There's stories of people going in inexplicably missing connected to this mysterious house. One notable story is that of a British priest who was said to have initially built the property to serve as a church who went missing shortly before it was finished. When an investigation was launched to look for him, they supposedly discovered a secret tunnel that led to a neighborhood in the northeast and the priest's body was never discovered. Now another story was that three construction workers in the basement of a neighboring building weren't paying attention to what they were doing and broke through a thin wall leading into building 81. They went through the hole and the three of them vanished. And now there are people who conspire that this event is what led the government to cancel its plans to demolish the building for fear that it might be haunted. And it hasn't been yet because it's still standing there and you're more than welcome to visit. You can take a guided ghost tour if you're feeling brave enough and hopefully you come back. Number 5, Area 51, Nevada. Starting out our list, we have the most obvious entry. In the American state of Nevada, you will find no shortage of places to go on vacation. Despite being a desert, you will find locations like the Hoover Dam. Red Rock Canyon, and of course, the various casinos and attractions in Las Vegas. Of course, a location that you will not find yourself getting into is the military base located on the salt flats of Groom Lake, which is colloquially known as Area 51. For years, Area 51 has been the subject of conspiracy theories involving everything from government testing to UFO activity. Adding to its mystique is the fact that the US government wouldn't even officially acknowledge that it existed until 2000. 2013. Its official use is apparently the testing of experimental aircraft, but the level of security at the base is extremely high, even for a government base. Employees of Area 51 are flown in on a private airline known as Janet Airlines, with Janet being an acronym that stands for just another non-existent terminal. Some former employees have reported getting paid through private companies that they have no involvement with in order to avoid a paper trail linking them to the base. Some theories about the purpose of Area 51 include it being used to develop energy weapons for the Strategic Defense Initiative, to develop time travel technology, and most infamously, for studying, storing, and reverse engineering the remains of crashed alien ships, including those that were found at the Roswell crash site. As it is a closed off and secret government facility, tourists are of course not allowed to get into the site, with signs around the perimeter promising prosecution and possibly even deadly force against trespassers. Of course, this hasn't stopped alien enthusiasts from making the journey to Nevada to see the number of Area 51 and alien adjacent attractions, such as bus tours of the extraterrestrial highway, the black mailbox, and the outskirts of this secret government facility. Number 4. The Princess Theatre, Alberta In the Canadian city of Edmonton, Alberta, there is no shortage of movie theaters with multiple malls housing multiple multiplexes, enabling local cinema lovers to watch the latest in entertainment. However, for many years, the crown jewel for movie lovers in Edmonton was not the Cineplex in West Edmonton Mall, or even the Garneau Theatre which shows independent and classic films. No. For many years, the most classic of the theatres was the Princess Theatre on White Avenue. Built in 1914, for a then staggering 
$1,000. This three-story, single-screen theater would show moving pictures, concerts, and vaudeville acts, while also having a basement billiards parlor for those not interested in the shows. The theater was known for implementing extremely novel and modern elements, such as a fireproof projection room, an electric time projection clock, an electronic ticketing machine, forced air ventilation, and even refrigerated fountain beverages. The theater was soon drawn into economic hardship and was forced to construct rental apartments on the upper and lower floors. One of these apartment renters was soon met with a tragic and disturbing end. According to local legend, an engaged woman lived in one of the upper apartments, but mere days before she was due to be wed, she was scorned by her fiancé. She was found hanging from the rafters while dressed in her wedding dress. In the years that followed, employees and patrons of the princess reported seeing a ghostly woman wearing a white dress who would suddenly appear and disappear, ascending the theater's grand staircase, wandering its ornate gold-leafed halls, or even hovering over the projection room. The princess was a staple for local cinema lovers, as well as fans of the paranormal for decades. But if you were interested in taking in a show or catching a glimpse of the ghostly bride, you may have missed your window, as the theater closed its doors after 108 years of operation in mid-2022. No new owners or plans for the historical theater have been announced, and the doors remain locked to the public, with only the ghosts still residing inside of this historic building. Number 3. Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center, Virginia In a world that seems to constantly be on the brink of disaster, it is comforting to know that the US government has a safe location where the elite and powerful will be safe from destruction they most likely caused. Such is the purpose of the US Department of Homeland Security operated base located near Bluemont, Virginia. The Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center, otherwise known as the the High Point Special Facility has been in operation since the late 1800s, when it was used as a simple weather station. In 1928, the observatory building became President Calvin Coolidge's summer White House, before being used as a civilian public service facility, where conscientious objectors could serve the government during World War II without having to go into conflict. In 1959, an underground facility was completed and designated Area B. The other buildings that were referred to as Area A became training facilities for the Federal Emergency Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. Around this time, it became a relocation site for high-level civilian and military officials in the event of a national disaster, such as an attack or massive natural disaster. It plays a major role in many of the United States government's contingency plans for maintaining the continuity of government. It has a high-frequency radio system, which connects it to most federal public safety agencies, which allows the president to access and use the emergency alert system so that they can broadcast emergency alerts or warnings. An example of its use was on September 11, 2001, when the majority of congressional leadership were taken from Washington by helicopter and evacuated to Mount Weather. The National Art Gallery has also developed a program that would have the country's most valuable paintings helicoptered over to the facility in the event of an attack, in order to make sure important cultural pieces are preserved in the event of an attack that would otherwise destroy them. Obviously, this site is off limits to all but the most high level of people, and it is not open for tourists. But if you are nearby, and see a large group of frantic looking officials arriving by helicopter, or you see a message on TV from the president being broadcast from this facility, be very afraid, as it means that something terrifying and horrible has or is about to occur. Number 2. Boblo Island Amusement Park, Ontario North America has no shortage of amusement parks for families and thrill seekers alike to visit. The Canadian province of Ontario has several to choose from, including Canada's Wonderland, Great Wolf Lodge, and Splashtown Niagara. One theme park that you won't be able to buy a ticket for, however, is the Boblo Island Amusement Park, located on the island of Bois Blanc, just above the mouth of the Detroit River. The park was opened in 1898 and used a ferry system to service guests from Ontario and Detroit and bring them to the island, where they had a variety of attractions to keep them occupied and having fun. Some of these included the Falling Star, a log flume, a theater, a sky tower, a ferris wheel, a zoo, a carousel, and a dance hall, financed by Henry Ford himself. It also had three roller coasters, the Screamer, the Nightmare, and the Sky Streak. It also had Boblo's scoot boats, which were essentially aquatic bumper cars. The park operated for many years before eventually closing down for financial reasons in late 1993. There are still ferries that operate in order to get island residents on and off the island, but the now abandoned amusement park has been declared off limits by the property owners. Of course, the dilapidated carousel building, dance pavilion, and sky tower have since proven to be too appealing for urban explorers to keep away from, and the eerie overgrown 
site still sees a variety of visitors. Like any good amusement park, it of course has a reputation for being haunted by a variety of ghosts. My personal favorite of the ghost stories is the story of Smiley the Magician. Back when the theater still operated and showed a variety of different performers, one of the most consistently booked performers of the 30s and 40s was a magician named Smiley Smilovich. Smiley was an old school magician who had trained with Houdini in the late 20s and was known for his seemingly death defying tricks. One of his most famous tricks was a metamorphosis trick, where he would put a trunk on stage, climb into it, lock it, and then have the trunk set on fire. He would escape through a trap door, the trunk would burn away, revealing that he had escaped, and the crowd would go wild. One day he was doing this trick as usual, but when he locked himself in the trunk, he had a heart attack and died. The trunk was set on fire, and the audience was left in terror as Smiley's body burned in front of them. Ever since then, Smiley's ghost would apparently haunt the theater, being sighted watching shows that were performed there, showing a special interest in magic shows. In the years since the park's closure, the occasional rumor of the magician being spotted has come up from the various urban explorers checking out the overgrown buildings. Would you ever be brave enough to explore Boblo Island Amusement Park? And if you did, would you be on the lookout for spectral magicians? Number 1. North Brother Island, New York The North Brother Island is one of two small islands located in the East River of New York City. The island remained uninhabited until 1885, with the only trace of humanity being a small lighthouse that was erected in 1869. The island began seeing more use in 1885 when the Riverside Smallpox Hospital moved from Roosevelt Island to North Brother, when their mission expanded to treating and isolating victims of other quarantinable diseases such as typhoid, tuberculosis, and especially polio. In 1904, a steamship called the General Slocum was set ablaze, and over a thousand people perished, either from the fire or from drowning while trying to escape, and ended up washing ashore on the island. One of the most famous residents at the hospital was Mary Mallon, otherwise known as Typhoid Mary, who was confined on the island for 20 years until her death in 1938, after having been declared a public health menace for infecting between 51 and 122 people while working as a cook. As public health measures like vaccines began to be adopted in the 30s and 40s, the need for a quarantine hospital lessened to the point where the hospital was closed. It was converted into housing for war veterans who were going to school in the city following World War II, before being converted into a rehabilitation facility for young people suffering from substance abuse issues. But it was closed in 1963 due to the cost of upkeep and the widespread corruption of the staff. In the years since, it was considered for a variety of purposes, including housing for the homeless and an extension of the jail at Rikers Island. But the danger of the unmarked man holes and the advanced dilapidation of the buildings, which are mostly collapsed and overrun by poison ivy, resulted in such ideas being abandoned. It was eventually decided that the site would serve as a bird sanctuary for herons and other wading shorebirds. Although many of the original 25 buildings are still standing in some shape or form, it has been made off limits to the public and is only available for supervised visits for those intending to go ashore for quote, compelling academic and scientific purposes. With its history of confinement and death, perhaps it is best that this site has been deemed unfit for public visitation, although the history of the island is indeed compelling. In fifth place we have Mount Athos in Greece. Mount Athos is a mountain and peninsula in the northeastern Greece and is an important center of Eastern Orthodox monasticism, which has been occupied for more than a millennium by Russian Orthodox monks. I promise I try with pronunciation. The long-standing gender ban on this ancient mountain doesn't apply to just women, but also includes many female domestic animals. So uh, how the heck has the animal population not died out yet? Also uh, more importantly, who the heck has the job of wandering around and policing animal genitalia. I genuinely want to know how that's like policed because in my brain it's currently playing a very Looney Tunes skit and I'm <laughs> cackling as you can see. Does someone bring in fresh creatures from the mainland to help with the population? Sure in the Jurassic Park universe all the dinosaurs are female but that's entirely different because they're still able to like procreate under monitoring and careful breeding but um males don't have the same nesting organs to make this a reality. Okay fine I'll get it back on topic but if anyone knows anything about how the heck this could be achieved please let me know in the comments. Commonly known amongst Greeks as the Holy Mountain, the self-governed Mount Athos, which encompasses both the mountain and a peninsula in Macedonia, is accessible only via ferry and only to men with a special permit. If you want to visit the mount, the first step is to submit a copy of your passport to the Mount Athos Pilgrims Bureau. Each day, 100 Orthodox and 10 non-Orthodox male pilgrims are admitted for a three-night stay in one of the peninsula's 20 monasteries. The centuries-old belief maintains that the presence of females inhibits their path to the spiritual enlightenment of the monks living there, amongst its, you know, once again, 20 monasteries, and also to ensure celibacy, which I would understand if it weren't also for the ban on female animals. For crying out loud, folks, if you take a vow of celibacy, your willpower should be enough, or maybe... It ain't for you if you can't control yourself around a woman. I'm gonna start screeching about sexist dress codes for the same reasons if I don't watch myself. 
Fun fact, over the years, a handful of women have been successful in sneaking onto Mount Athos's forbidden to female shores, including a French writer who reportedly underwent a double mastectomy in order to disguise herself as a monk in the 1920s, and more recently, four Moldovan women who illegally entered Greece and accidentally ended up there. Backtracking really quickly, it was first invaded in 382 by the Placencia, the daughter of the Emperor Theodosius. Greek journalist Malvina Karali was the latest woman to break the ban and enter onto the territory of Mount Athos, when, as she claims, she entered the sanctuary dressed as a man in the 1990s. Atta girls. In fourth place, we have the Galaxy Water Park in Bavaria. Alrighty, so this might not be as terrifying as some of the other places on this list in the, you know, I fear for my life or men are doing scary things type of way, but just stay with me here. One of Europe's largest and most popular water parks, which is part of the sprawling Therm Erding sauna complex near Munich, banned women from one of its high speed slides because owners determined it to be causing, um, intimate injuries. According to a park official, at least six women suffered injury to their genital area on the extreme phase slide, in which participants can reportedly hit speeds up to 45 miles per hour. Pardon me while I pick my jaw up off the floor. For starters, as someone with the genitalia referred to, I'm wondering how the heck the other um, genitalia, which to my knowledge is more sensitive upon impact, surviving, you know, without being in the same amount of pain or worse. Come on, one bad soccer ball to the collapsible schlong and nuts and, uh, down goes the human. Whereas for those who possess the genitalia that uh, isn't that, I can speak for experience that I can withstand that and uh, not fall to my knees. So what kind of targeted water pressure hell does this slide have that people are getting injured from? Now a park spokesman told an English language newspaper that it was working on developing a special bodysuit for women to prevent such mishaps in the future. According to a gynecological association that was referenced in the newspaper, however, there was no medical condition other than pregnancy that should prevent women from using such a slide. Yeah, I'm giving this water park some serious side eye. Honestly, is there not some kind of overall health and safety thing that can come into play to fix this nonsense? In third place, we have Saudi Arabia. If you're a solo female traveler looking to visit Saudi Arabia as a tourist, you'll have an easier time booking a trip to Mars. As of 2010, tourist visas to Saudi Arabia don't exist, and visas for business and to visit family are notoriously difficult for women to obtain. On top of that, women who travel to the country normally must be accompanied by a male relative in order to be granted entry. And even though some things have lightened over the years, Saudi Arabia isn't exactly a welcoming destination for women. Women just needing a man or government permission to do just about anything. Saudi Arabian women aren't even allowed to drive. Now, as a gal who watches WWE, this is something I've noticed before. When they started hosting events in Saudi Arabia back in 2014, women were not allowed to wrestle on those shows, not until 2019. At that first event in 2019, Lacey Evans, a wrestler who usually competes in a, like, two-piece, very revealing outfit, wore a full black bodysuit instead of her normal ring attire, with a very large baggy shirt over top due to the country's conservative dress policy. This became the norm for women's matches until 2021, when women were allowed to customize their bodysuits but still had to wear the baggy shirts. Crown Jewel of 2021 was also the first show to feature more than one women's match. It was only in 2022 when women were able to ditch the baggy shirts, but to this day still have to wear the one-piece outfits. Was this a long way to compare the portrayal of women and their rights in North America versus Saudi Arabia? Yes. But was it also the easiest and most factual way I knew how? Also yes. In second place, we have the sacred Japanese island, Okinoshima. Okinoshima is an island 60 kilometers off of the coast of Kyushu in the Genkai Sea. I swear I looked up how to pronounce these things, so if I get it wrong, blame the interwebs. But with its remote location, steep cliffs, primeval forests, and almost no infrastructure other than a simple port, it doesn't exactly look like the most welcoming place at first glance. But the island apparently has a lot going for it, even though the only official inhabitant of Okinoshima is a single Shinto priest tending to the island's shrine, which is alternatively known as Okitsugu, part of the Munakata Taisha Grand Shrine, complex spread across a total of two islands and the Kyushu mainland. Pardon me, it's a series of priests who spend 10 day intervals on the almost deserted island, but always one at a time. They have two jobs, hey, just like most of us in this economy. One is to chant prayers to Tagorohime, daughter of the sun goddess Amaterasu, one of the most important deities in the entire Shinto pantheon. The second is to make sure that no woman ever steps foot on the island. Not to sound like a broken record, but I've worked less stupid jobs, and that's saying something. I'm a workaholic performer, so when I say my resume is as long as my arm, me calling a job stupid means something. Women are strictly prohibited from landing on Okinoshima, and the actual cause of which isn't fully understood. Some say it's because of women's links to menstrual fluid, which is considered impure by some Shinto schools of thought. Other theories say that women aren't allowed on Okinoshima to protect them as some Japanese goddesses have been known to be distrustful of potential rivals. In the past, artists specializing in image of Benzaiten, the syncretic Japanese goddess of beauty, music, and love, were actually advised not to marry so as to not make the deity jealous about them having another woman in their lives. But there are are no such stories about Tagorohime, and allegedly she isn't even the most important deity in the neighborhood. The whole of Okinoshima is. So all you've got is the 
impurity of a natural function and maybe offending a goddess? And by my research, no one is 100% sure that's accurate? Alrighty, moving on before I start saying words in French that will for sure anger the interweb gods. Apparently in the Shinto religion, it's not uncommon for land masses to be worshipped as gods, which is actually the case with the island of Mayahima, home to the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the Itsukushima Shrine, which is why the complex's main shrine and Tori Gate were constructed on the shore and on the water instead of deeper on the island. When it comes to women, however, they are absolutely allowed on that one. Some Shinto sites, yes, do exclude female visitors, such as Mount Omin or Mount Mount Sanjo in the Narata prefecture. But here's the kicker. They at least have historic records proving that the practice goes back centuries. With Okinoshima, no one really knows how the no women allowed rule started. The Okitsumiya shrine dates back to around the 17th century, but religious rites were performed on Okinoshima as far back as the 4th century. In all that time, no written account about women being banned from the island has surfaced. In fact, the whole idea sounds contrary to the origins of Okinoshima as a deity. The best available evidence says that the island was a seafaring guidepost on a trading route to Korea, as well as a harbor for fisher folk venturing far out into the sea. To ensure safe sea passages through dangerous waters, these mariners would stop at Okinoshima and make offerings of mirrors, bronze dragon ornaments, food, and much more. Oh, I'm not done yet! According to interviews conducted by Dr. Lindsay E. DeWitt from the University of California, it was common for centuries for male-female fishing couples to travel to the island together to make offerings. It's not clear when that changed, but it did. Starting around the Edo period, so between 1603 to 1868, Okinoshima became off limits to women. That's a smidge too recent in history, ergo me making a face right now. A little bit suspicious. Fun fact, there used to be a tradition of allowing 200 men onto the island on May 27th every year, but only after they stripped naked and underwent a sacred rite of ablution that they could never ever ever talk about in detail whatever they saw on that day. But after Okinoshima became Japan's 21st UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2017, the ceremony was cancelled indefinitely. Fascinating sidebar. During that annual event, every man admitted to Okinoshima was forbidden from removing anything from the island. I'm talking no pebbles or talking about what they saw or experienced there. Here's the fun historical thing though. Huge archaeological expeditions in the past have removed much more than pebbles from the island. Currently the Munakata Taisha Shrine Museum in Kyushu houses 80,000 precious artifacts, including bronze mirrors, beads, and shards of glass presumably brought to Japan by way of the distant Silk Road, which were all taken from Okinoshima. And yet the island is still standing, so maybe the gods would also be fine with female visitors? Just saying. In first place we have the La Rinconda gold mine. Ah, gold mines. Reminds me of home. I grew up in a gold mining town, so it's part of my history. Heck, my preference for silver jewelry over gold quite often vexes my dad. So sadly, while women in my town were, you know, on equal footing with the men, this isn't going to be as lovely of a tale. The La Rinconada gold mine in Peru is both the highest elevated settlement on the planet at 16,732 feet and perhaps the most exploitative place in the world. People come to this remote hellhole to work for the corporation that owns the mine for zero pay. At the end of their 30 day shift, they can take home as much raw ore as they can carry, but here's the catch. They don't know if there's actually any gold in the ore. Not gonna lie, I doubted that statement at first, so I actually called up my dad, and he confirmed it for me. It's all certainly illegal, but no one's doing anything about it. The town the mine is a part of has zero sanitation, no plumbing, most of the trash is burned in the streets, and city services simply don't exist. But the most bizarre aspect of this brutal, unforgiving town is the fact that women aren't allowed to enter the mines, all because of superstitions. All they're allowed to do is pan for gold in the wastewaters coming off the mountain. And hey, knowing what we know now about spotted gold and ore, they might be getting the better part of this deal. Worse than being barred from the only source of potential income in the area is the fact that many women are exploited at the mine. If panning for gold fails them, many women are forced into, um, schmecks work, including the underage folks. Okay, no trips to Peru anytime soon. Noted! 